I am your host, James Morgan, and this is History of Cities. Episode 4, Brother Against Brother. We last left off with the end of the Second Greco-Persian War, in which the Greek alliance was able to secure independence for not only mainland Greece, but also the Greek colonial cities in Anatolia. The Greeks had been able to defeat the much more powerful Persian Empire through use of superior tactics and unprecedented alliance of Greek city-states. This alliance had been dominated by the two most powerful Greek cities, Athens and Sparta. These long-time rivals had put aside their differences to face the invading armies and together repelled them. However, soon the Greeks would return to infighting as differences in their goals for the war caused the alliance to split. The Athenians went on to form the Delian League to continue the reconquest of the Greek cities in Asia, while the Spartans withdrew to their lands on the Peloponnese Peninsula. Even though they had recently worked together in the Hellenic Alliance, the rivalry between the two Greek powers soon flared up again, as Sparta feared the growing power of the Athenian Empire. Both sides eyed each other warily as conflict began to brew. Things really began to heat up as the Athenians expanded their armies and navies in 478 BC with the help of the Delian League. Sparta had been the undisputed military power in Greece, especially when it came to land, and Athens had previously recognized this and acquiesced to Spartan command of the Hellenic alliance. But now that Athens had the resources of the entire Delian League, they looked to build up their military power to more effectively control the territory they had brought into the Athenian Empire. With the conquest of nearly all the islands and coastline of the Aegean, especially the key city of Byzantium that guarded access to the Black Sea and the easiest crossing to Anatolia, Athens had complete dominance of the sea. Tensions were further stoked by the leading politician in Athens, our great man Themistocles, who was a fervent anti-Spartan and supported the rebuilding of walls around Athens to protect against the perceived threat of Sparta. This long wall created a safe corridor that connected Athens to the port city of Piraeus, which allowed for the resupply and reinforcement of Athens should a siege ever take place. When the walls were finished, the Athenians finally felt that they were strong enough to no longer recognize the hegemony of Sparta and declared themselves independent. War was narrowly avoided at this point when Themistocles had a falling out with his fellow citizens and was ostracized. We use this term generally nowadays to mean any time that an individual is excluded from a group, but in ancient Greece, it had a specific meaning of banishment for ten years. After Themistocles fled to Persia, his place as leading man in Athens was taken by another man we are already familiar with, Simon. Simon was much more genial towards the Spartans, and had been raised to leading man by the pro-Spartan faction in Athens. His rise would postpone hostilities for nearly 20 years, but it seemed conflict was inevitable. War nearly broke out in 464 BC, when the island of Thassos rebelled against the Athenian Empire, and the Spartans promised to aid the rebellion by invading Attica, the peninsula in which the city of Athens is located. This invasion never occurred, as by some act of God, a massive earthquake damaged Sparta and many of its city-state allies, paving the way for a revolt by the subjugated population on the Peloponnese. This population was called the Helots, and they were described by ancient historians as either slaves or a class between free men and slaves. Whatever the case, they were forced to labor for the benefit of the Spartan citizens and treated with inhuman cruelty. Every year, in the autumn, there would be a sort of purge where for the season it was legal to beat and kill any helot. This cruelty created a suffocating atmosphere of fear for both the Spartans and the helots, as the helots feared the constant abuse and the Spartans feared reprisals, of which there were many. The Spartans' fear was also driven by the fact that the helots greatly outnumbered them, with Heterodotus putting them at around seven times the population of Spartans at this time. The revolt in 464 was one among many for the Helots, but plays a significant role in our narrative because the Spartans were unable to quell the uprising on their own. They called for aid from the Hellenic Alliance, which had de facto ended when the Spartans left the war effort in 479, but still technically bound the members to aid each other. 
Each member answered the call, even Athens, who sent 4,000 soldiers led by Simon. However, the Spartans refused to accept the aid of Athens. This rebuke destroyed Simon's political career, and he was shortly ostracized by his opponents among the Athenian citizenry. Thus, the Spartans had removed their own agent, and the political temperature began to rise again. The exile of Simon precipitated a change in Athenian policy to one of aggressive diplomacy. In preparation for conflict with Sparta, Athens quickly allied other powerful Greek states. One of these new alliances was with a historic ally of Sparta, the city of Megara. Megara was currently at war with another of Sparta's allies, Corinth. The Megarans were outmatched by the Corinthians, and in 460 BC, called upon their new ally Athens to enter the war. Corinth was the connecting point between the peninsulas of Attica and Peloponnese, and the Athenian invasion of this land brought them into wider conflict with many powerful Peloponnesian cities, thus starting the First Peloponnesian War. The two sides of this war were the Peloponnesian League, led by Sparta, and the Athenian Empire, plus their allies. For the rest of the episode, I will refer to these sides as either the League or the Empire, just to keep things simple. As we learned in the last episode, the start of this war coincided with an ongoing Athenian military campaign in Egypt. This campaign drew a large portion of the Empire's forces away from mainland Greece and probably prevented a swift Athenian victory. Luckily for the Athenians, they only had to contend with lesser Peloponnesian cities at this time because for some unknown reason, the Spartans did not join in immediately. Despite the inaction of the Spartans, the League were able to defeat the Empire in a land battle at Heleus. It was a different story at sea, where the Athenians traditionally dominated, and the League was defeated by the Athenian fleet. This naval battle took place at the Saronic Gulf, which the naval rival of Athens, Aegina, considered to be their domain. As a result, the Aeginans joined the side of the League, adding their strong navy to the alliance. This added strength inspired the Allies to engage the Empire again, but they were once again defeated, this time decisively. The control of the seas paved the way for an Athenian invasion of the island Aegina was located. With all the Empire's armies tied down in either Egypt or in the Siege of Aegina, the Corinthians saw a chance to end the war by capturing the now unsupported city of Megara. Rather than recall their troops from Aegina, the Athenians decided to conscript a ragtag army of old men and young boys to relieve the garrison at Megara. This cobbled together army fought the Corinthians outside Megara in an indecisive battle that nonetheless saw the Corinthians retreat for the time being. About a week and a half later, the Corinthians returned but were this time routed and lost a large portion of their army during the retreat. The defeat of this army relieved the pressure from Megara and marked the end of the beginning part of the war. In the year 457 BC, the Spartans finally decided to join the war, but just like the Corinthians, they chose not to engage the empire directly, but instead moved to attack one of Athens' allies. They crossed the Corinthian Gulf and entered the region of Phocis, quickly forcing the Phoetians to bend the knee. The Spartans failed to protect their path of retreat, and the Athenian navy was able to block the Corinthian Gulf while they concluded terms of surrender with Phocis. With nowhere to go but forward, the Spartan army marched into the region just north of Athens, called Boeotia. The League was able to persuade the ruling party in Boeotia, the city of Thebes, to join them, which signaled an imminent invasion of the Athenian Empire's homeland. With the threat of invasion looming, the Empire sent as many troops as they could gather to face the League head-on, setting the stage for the largest battle of the war so far. The Spartans had decided to make their stand near the town of Tanagra, rather than march into Athenian home territory or retreat across the gulf that the Athenian navy patrolled. A force of 14,000 troops from the Empire meant 11,500 men from the League in the Battle of Tanagra. The fighting saw both sides sustain heavy casualties, but the League was eventually victorious, which allowed them to circumvent the Athenian navy and return to friendly territory. The Empire quickly regrouped after the battle, and although they were unable to stop the League's army from making their escape, 
they were able to launch a counteroffensive into Boeotia. This counteroffensive marked the first in a long string of Athenian victories after the Battle of Tanagra, with the empire first defeating the Boeotians at the Battle of Oenophyta, which allowed them to conquer all of Boeotia apart from Thebes. This was followed by the end of the Siege of Aegina, where the Aeginans were forced to join the empire and pay tribute to Athens. Following up on these successes, the empire's navy freely raided the Peloponnesian coast. These consecutive victories were contrasted by the expedition in Egypt, which suffered a devastating defeat in 454 BC, costing the empire a large number of ships and men. It was at this time that the center of wealth, and therefore power, in the Delian League was moved from Delos to Athens, strengthening the grip of the city over the de facto Athenian empire. The weakening of their position in the Aegean, the burden of administrating an expansive empire, and the still ongoing conflict with Persia, led to a change in sentiment in Athens towards the war with Sparta. So when Simon returned from his ten-year exile in 451 BC, he was charged with concluding a peace treaty with the Peloponnesian League. He was able to secure a five-year truce, which effectively ended the First Peloponnesian War and established peace among the Greeks, at least for a little while. Though this marks a natural stopping point, we still have a lot of time to fill in this episode, so I want to go over the interwar period and the events that would lead to the breakout of the Second Peloponnesian War, which is more consequential and larger in scale, so it was often just referred to as the Peloponnesian War. After going over these events, I will go over our obligatory what was Byzantium's role in all of this section, although I won't have much to say in this part. I want to reiterate why I focused so much on the conflict between the Greeks and Persians, and now the Athenians and Spartans, in a show that is supposed to focus on Byzantium. I believe it is important to understand the origins of united Greek identity that played a major role in the culture of Byzantium, as well as how the rivalry between Athens and Sparta roped Byzantium into inter-Greek wars that would gradually see the city establish its role as an important hinge point between factions, until it finally becomes a true power player much later in the 4th century. But now I am getting ahead of myself, and so we will return to our narrative of the interbellum between the Peloponnesian Wars. In 449 BC, the Greco-Persian Wars finally came to an end. At this time, Athens was experiencing its golden age, as they were undisputed masters of the Aegean Sea, and raked in immense wealth from their tributaries within the Athenian Empire. Pericles, the leading politician in Athens after the deaths of Themistocles and Simon, wanted to build on the good fortune by calling for a pan-Hellenic congress. The purpose of this congress was to establish a lasting peace among the Greek peoples and reaffirm the ideals of the Hellenic alliance that had fought together against the Persians. This dream was crushed when Sparta refused to attend, seeing the congress as another attempt by Athens to overtake them as hegemon of Greece. With this attempt at peace failing, minor conflicts again erupted, putting the two Greek superpowers back on the path to war. In 448 BC, a conflict over who should control the religiously important Oracle of Delphi pitted Spartan-backed Delphi against Athens-backed Phocis. The next year, a revolt broke out in Boeotia against Athens' rule. The Athenian army, under the command of Pericles, was defeated at the Battle of Cornea, causing the empire to abandon all their holdings in Boeotia, Phocis, and Locris. More important than the loss of these lands was the loss of faith in the strength of the empire, which inevitably led to further revolts in Euboea and Megara. Once again, Pericles summoned an army to sail to the island of Euboea and crush the revolt. When they landed, Pericles received word that a Spartan army had appeared in Attica, and he was forced to retreat and deal with this threat. The issue was resolved peacefully when the Spartan general accepted a bribe to take his army home, so Pericles was free to return to Euboea and finish the job. An overwhelming force of Athenians was able to quickly put down all the rebelling cities, but it was evident by the harsh punishments the Athenians imposed that they were afraid that their grip on their tributaries was slipping. In 445 BC, a formal peace treaty, named the Thirty Years' Peace, 
was signed by Athens and Sparta. This peace would not last nearly that long, but it did resolve some of the issues that had sparked the First Peloponnesian War. Megara was returned to the Peloponnesian League, despite the fact the League was never able to capture it during the war. Aegina was forced to become a tributary of Athens, but they were not forced to join the Athenian Empire and retain some amount of autonomy. The treaty also stipulated that both sides would respect each other's alliances, putting down in writing that Sparta recognized that Athens was a political peer with more or less the same amount of power. Since the victories in 457 BC, the Athenian Empire had been poised to sweep away their chief rival and unite Greece under their democratic system. But the disastrous expedition in Egypt and domestic rebellions had weakened their position to the point where when they signed a formal peace, it was on relatively even terms. The new status quo of a bipolar Greece meant the rivalry would continue, and come time, a more decisive war would have to be fought to see who was truly the hegemon of Greece. But that's a story for next time. For now, I will do my obligatory zoom in to Byzantium. There isn't really much written about the city at this time, but we can assume that they participated in the war the same way that many of the Athenian subjects did, by either sending troops or cash to aid the empire. As we saw in the previous episode, Byzantium was important to Athens because of its prime location and therefore important trade connections. While during the First Peloponnesian War, the League did not have anywhere near enough naval power to threaten this trade, we will see in the coming conflict that Byzantium will become more threatened. Due to this lucrative strategic position, the Athenians extracted massive tributes from the city, which increased tension between subject and master. At this point, Byzantium is not strong enough itself to break free from the yoke of Athens, but as we have seen, and will continue to see, they are not shy about switching sides to whoever will give them the better deal, or has a large army outside their door. Since I've run out of things to say about this conflict, and this episode is unfortunately going to be a bit short, I want to pad some runtime by zooming out and looking at the wider picture, both east and west of Byzantium. To the west, at the outbreak of the First Peloponnesian War in 460 BC, it had been just over 30 years since the last king of Rome was overthrown and the Roman Republic established. It is hard to overstate the immense impact this event had on history, but it is entirely possible that someone in Greece could have lived at the same time as the last king and witnessed the start of the Peloponnesian War, and he would have easily said that the latter was the more important event. It is only in hindsight that we can see the longevity and unbelievable success of the Roman Republic overshadowing these climactic events in Greece. To the east, the Persian Empire was ruled by the eldest son of Xerxes, Artaxerxes I, who oversaw a period of relative stability in the chronically tumultuous empire. Artaxerxes was a much more diplomatic and cunning ruler than his grandfather or father, and was not prone to petty grudge-holding as they were. In fact, he even gave asylum and land to Themistocles when he was exiled from Athens, despite the fact his empire had lost important battles to this Greek general. Artaxerxes established many things in Persia, such as the proliferation of Aramaic, the language Jesus likely spoke, as the language of the empire. He also saw Zoroastrianism become the nominal religion of the empire. Most importantly to our story, he adopted a new foreign policy in regards to Greece that emphasized bribery and political maneuvering over traditional military intervention. This policy will play a huge role in our next episode, so keep it in mind. All in all, the 41-year reign of Artaxerxes witnessed the end of the Greco-Persian Wars and the start of THE Peloponnesian War. After his death, Persia will not see the same level of internal political stability until the next emperor of his name, Artaxerxes II, takes the throne 20 years later. It is most likely, if you asked any Greek person in the 400 BC if Rome or Persia is the greater threat to Greek sovereignty, they would answer Persia. Due to the strange winds of history, however, it would be Greece that conquers Persia, and the little Roman Republic that overtakes them both in the coming centuries. That is a story for another time.
Next time, we'll have a longer episode on the 30-year conflict that is the Peloponnesian War. As always, if you have any questions or think I missed anything, please feel free to email me at hofcpod.cast at gmail.com or DM me on Twitter at hofc underscore podcast. Thank you for listening to this episode. Please join me next time for the history of Byzantium.